In the early 2000s, The Lord of the Rings had managed to gain quite a lot of pop culture traction. Peter Jackson's trilogy was about to be released as the first major live-action adaptation of this series, and people were excited. Of course, this meant that people wanted to get aboard that bandwagon, including plenty of B-grade documentarians. Today, we are going to be watching one of these documentaries, the 2001 straight-to-VHS classic, J.R.R. Tolkien, The Master of the Rings. Not to be confused, of course, with the other documentary, The Master of the Rings, the unauthorized story of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, which was made in the same year by, uh, by the same guy. Yeah, same guy. Word of advice to Stephen Grant, if you happen to be watching this. Uh, don't do this. Don't name two documentaries the same thing. It took me minutes of research to figure out if they were even different documentaries. It's minutes of my life, Mr. Grant. This is an absolutely wild ride of poor editing choices and misinformed hot takes. So uh, strap in, buckle up, cause we're going for a ride today. But before we start, I wanna talk a little bit about today's sponsor. I have been obsessed with trying to find my own signature scent for probably 10 years now. And finally, with this week's sponsor, Scentbird, that's possible. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that ships you a new scent every single month. They have an insane range of products available, all the way from Gucci and Prada to smaller brands like Confessions of a Rebel. You can have any scent of your choosing mailed directly to your door every month for just $17. But if you use the link in my description and the coupon code HOBBIT, you can get 55% off your order. That's just a little bit over $7 for your first month, available in the US and Canada. Scentbird has very graciously sent me three scents to try out this week. I thought I would go for a lighter and more floral selection. First up, we have the scent Mirrored Image. It's very light and fruity, with notes of pear and orange flower. It's very elegant. And next up, we have Peony Silk by Mare. Ooh, the jasmine comes through really nicely on this one. It's, it's very sweet. And then finally, we have White Rose and Lemon Leaves by Joe Loves. Ooh, this one is very rose forward, which is one of my favorite scents, but it also has a little bit of cedar wood in it, which gives it a nice kind of grounded earthy feeling. I think that this scent is probably my favorite, and although I'll wear all of them, I think this is gonna be my daily wear for the rest of the summer. And I will have plenty of scent to wear because each of these bottles comes with a full 30 day supply. Plus they send you one of these new designs for their cute little cases, which just snap closed around the product, and then that's locked, and that's open. I really cannot recommend Scentbird enough. I've actually been using their service for years, way before they ever sponsored me, and I love getting to play around with my fragrances every single month. So if you want to try out Scentbird yourself, check out the link in my description and use my code HOBBIT to get 55% off. Again, that is just a little over $7 for that first month, and you do not want to miss that. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring this week. It really, really means the world, and let's get back to the video. This documentary starts out real strong with an opening month. Montage. God, I love a montage. We're greeted by loud, generic fantasy music and fantasy images that fly by so fast that it's it's very hard to see what's going on in them. They also intercut this footage with random snippets of interviews, some of them in varying quality, but during these interviews, they lower the volume of the music to approximately 10% of what it was before. Read, 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 read. And then immediately back to full volume. Brilliant. And it fluctuates like this through the rest of this relatively long montage. Like, do we really need to have the music back to full blast between these two interviews? By the style of the prose. He's a master craftsman. It was like two, three seconds maximum. I say that as someone who's only just now figured out what volume to put her music at during her videos, but you know. With that done, we get a few more people talking about how great Middle Earth is before we jump straight into a full exploration of the geography of Middle Earth. And you may be thinking to yourself, that's a, it's a bit of a weird place to start, considering it's not all that relevant to the actual topic of the documentary, J.R.R. Tolkien. But my friend, there you would be wrong, because we needed this section up front so that they could show off their state-of-the-art CGI map. Yeah, baby, look at those mountains, those smooth, smooth plains, those 
Those floating location markers. Okay, I'll admit I'm being harsh. For 2001, this probably was pretty state-of-the-art. And by placing it literally only four minutes into the documentary, it's clear that this CGI map is their pride and joy. So maybe it wasn't the best idea to have that CGI map be the introduction to your documentary, but... Hey, what do I know? I'm still using lame 2D paper maps. But the 2001 CGI aside, I do have some problems with this being placed so prominently at the beginning of the documentary. Because all our narrator does as he walks us through this map over the next six minutes is pretty much just say what each of the places are in a sentence. Beyond the Misty Mountains and the Great River Anduin stands the Forest of Mirkwood. And that's fine info, but placing it at the very beginning of the documentary without the larger context of The Lord of the Rings, it, it's just random facts and words. Plus this part is very, very boring. It's verging on painful. It's kind of like a trial by fire to make sure that only the most dedicated of Lord of the Rings documentary fans will continue watching. And hey, I stuck around, so. Guess that says something. But after our fictional geographical crash course and a full 10 minutes into the documentary, we finally start talking about its subject, the Master of the Rings himself. They start by providing some just bare bones biographical information about Tolkien, but then guess what? In sharp contrast to the last documentary that we watched on this channel, they actually talk about Tolkien's wife, Edith, for more than a sentence. Ronald, as Tolkien preferred to be called, and his brother Hilary were looked after by an aunt and came to live in a boarding house where, in 1908, Tolkien met Edith Bratt, a fellow lodger three years his senior and, like him, an orphan. After a long courtship, beset with difficulties arising from their different religious backgrounds, Edith eventually converted to Catholicism and she and Ronald married in 1916. I mean, it's only two sentences, but you know, that's, that's baby steps, people. They explain that her and Tolkien's relationship was beset with difficulties arising from their different religious backgrounds. Which is sort of true. This would become a larger problem as their relationship moved on and as the two of them grew up. Because despite the fact that Tolkien was a super, super devout Catholic, Edith never really seemed to assimilate to Catholicism and kind of always seemed to miss being Anglican. But back in the beginning of their relationship, this wasn't as prominent of an issue when compared to their three year age gap. Tolkien's guardian at the time didn't really like the two of them being together because Edith was Anglican and Tolkien was Catholic, yes, but also because Tolkien was only 16 and she was 19. The relationship was very sudden and it seemed to be distracting Tolkien from his studies, so his guardian forbade him from seeing Edith until he was no longer under the guardian's control. So the narrator isn't like outright wrong, but I think that diving just a little bit deeper into the foundations of this incredibly complex and formative relationship would have done them a lot of good. Guys, next up we have my favorite thing in the whole world, documentary recreations. For some reason they decided to put this really weird filter over all of their live action footage, probably to hide some of the details, but still we get a hobbit hole. Check out that hobbit hole. I just love pre-Peter Jackson imagery of the Lord of the Rings, um, especially in live action. I think it's fascinating to see how other people pictured Middle Earth. And this documentary, we get to see a lot of that kind of footage. Throughout the documentary, they also integrate a lot of interview footage from Tolkien himself. I believe specifically from the 1968 BBC interview with Tolkien. And look, I really like Tolkien, he, obviously, but I will say, that he was definitely a mumbler of the highest order. His official biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, even made sure to note this in literally the first chapter of Tolkien's biography. Carpenter wrote, he does not speak clearly. Words come out in eager rushes, whole phrases are elided or compressed in the haste of his emphasis. Tolkien was a brilliant man with a beautiful mind, but he was not the best at speaking clearly, particularly on, you know, over 50 year old footage. I just wish that this documentary had provided captions or something because I am gonna play you a clip of Tolkien's interview and I want you guys to respond in the comments with what you think he's saying. Manor Road, of course, everything is destroyed. I mean, Manor Road, which I lived in, <laughs> is now being completely destroyed. There's an enormous uh, uh, combined English and law library built there. I 
cannot award whoever gets it correct, because frankly, I have no clue what he's saying, but I would love to hear your guys' interpretation. So, you know, let me know. But to their credit, this documentary does do a pretty good job of telling us how the Lord of the Rings came to be. Sometimes people will try to simplify it by just saying that the Lord of the Rings is a sequel to The Hobbit, but that's not really a true representation of how it came about. Instead, in this documentary, they explore the Lord of the Rings as a sort of natural conclusion to the larger world that Tolkien had been writing, something that was far larger than The Hobbit. And you know what, for that very competent explanation of how things went down, I will give them kudos. This next part though, I, I shall not grant them the same thing because they're about to spend the entire center chunk of this documentary just summarizing the plot of The Lord of the Rings. And I'll whine more about this particular topic at the end of the video, but I'm just not sure that this section of the documentary was necessary. I would understand a brief overview of the story, but this part is a full 20 minutes long in a documentary that is only an hour and 20 minutes long. And that's a lot of time and budget to put into something that Let's be honest, if you manage to make it through the 3D map trial at the beginning of this documentary, you probably know all of this info. I think that they would have benefited much more from doing a deeper dive into the actual subject of this documentary, at least according to the title, J.R.R. Tolkien, rather than getting bogged down in the details of summarizing a story that we all probably already know. I'm not gonna torture you by reiterating every single point that they make in this part of the documentary, so instead, uh, please accept this montage of all of my favorite moments of live action footage from it. plot summary, they begin discussing the critical reception to The Lord of the Rings. Professional critics tend to regard The Lord of the Rings, if they regard it at all, with a varying mix of indifference, condescension, and contempt. And you know, I'll give them some benefit of the doubt. Maybe things really were super different in the literary landscape of 2001, but even just like a really quick Google search shows me over 40,000 articles written about The Lord of the Rings before 2001. Of course, it did have its critics throughout the decades, especially those that prefer street smart irony and all manner of gleeful postmodern mayhem. But it was an immensely popular book and a bestseller that garnered plenty of critical acclaim, even pretty shortly after its publication. Trying to claim that it was regarded with contempt by, you know, most literary critics feels like, kind of like you're trying to play up the victim complex thing. It's a pretty popular book and that's okay. They then try to start defending The Lord of the Rings against people who say that its characters are unrealistic and poorly developed by, um, by saying that its characters are unrealistic and poorly developed, but that it's okay that they're unrealistic and poorly developed. Now, I will agree with them on the front that the Lord of the Rings characters are not written like modern characters, where oftentimes we get to see their internal journeys and we're really made privy to what they're thinking at a given moment. But to say that this means his characters are poorly written or underdeveloped is, is frankly ridiculous to me. I have a whole series on this channel where I analyze characters characters from the story, and I compare their book portrayal to their movie portrayal. And something that we frequently run into is the fact that Peter Jackson took the existing internal journeys and externalized them. But that doesn't mean that those internal journeys weren't existing in the book already. I took particular issue with the things that this literary critic was saying. It isn't a work that deals with character. The characters are, by and large, stereotype. You know, some people might say archetypes, but I'm always a little bit sceptical about that. I'm not sure quite what the difference between an archetype and a stereotype is, except that one might be damaging and the other might 
seem a bit more attractive. The thing is, right here she does identify the difference between archetype and stereotype. Archetype is used to describe recurring patterns of character. Characters that have certain traits that are deemed by generations of storytellers to be valuable traits that are worth telling over and over again. Whereas stereotype is a reductionist word with a clear negative connotations that tries to say that those archetypical characters are flat and not worth telling. And you can prefer, you know, archetypical characters or really original characters one over the other, and God knows this lady does by claiming that the Lord of the Rings doesn't deal with character. But the archetypical and formulaic nature of Tolkien's characters are essential and critical to the way that Tolkien processes and tells stories. In his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien writes about something that he calls the cauldron of story. And he uses this metaphor to explore the way in which stories function across time and space. In the collective human imagination, he proposes, there is a great bubbling melting pot of stories. Into it go myth and religion and people and stories, and all of these elements are broken apart and simmered together. The character of King Arthur, for example, perhaps starts out as a real person, but then he is broken down into his component parts and reused again and again in story after story. He's taken out of the cauldron by a new generation of storytellers, transformed, and placed back in for ever changed and ready to be used again. Tolkien's characters are not original. They couldn't be. He makes deft use out of the cauldron of story, pulling up kings and wizards and heroes, repurposing them, and then placing them back into the landscape of story forever changed by his tales. These characters are not stereotypes or dull or underwritten. They are a fundamental part of the way that we as humans tell stories. Now usually, if someone wants to tell me that they don't like the characters in the Lord of the Rings books, I, I'm gonna let that slide because that's none of my business, people like what they're gonna like. But to have someone try to minimize one of the most artistically beautiful parts of Tolkien's story in a documentary about J.R.R. Tolkien, it feels like a major misstep. And if anything, so-called experts saying things like this about Tolkien's works only pushes us further away from being willing to engage in Tolkien's stories as true, enjoyable works of literature in the modern era. The literary critics' points are intercut with this guy, who has been insisting for quite a few minutes now that Tolkien's orcs are not racist. And it's not really my place to say whether or not they are definitively, but I am inclined to agree with him. I just don't necessarily agree with the way that he is presenting his points. They do things, they have ethnic characteristics, you might say, but it is a mistake to expect Tolkien to represent any particular people in his writing. So while you do have a, uh, a, an apparently Germanic tribe, uh, the, the, uh, the Rohirrim, does that mean that Tolkien is showing us the Goths? No. Does it mean he's showing us the Franks? No. The Vandals? No. The Waffen SS? No. Just because these guys are blonde and, uh, and speak Gothic uh, or German and, uh, and behave in certain ways like certain Germanic tribes, that does not mean that is what he's trying to represent to us. Tolkien's creating a realistic, generic German tribe, if you will, and he's using it as part of his story. I just don't think this is necessarily the way to frame this conversation. What he should have brought up is the idea of allegory. I'm sure we've all heard the line from Tolkien that he hated or at least cordially disliked allegory in all of its forms, but if we look further into the quote, he goes on to say, I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one, applicability, resides in the freedom of the reader, and the other, allegory, in the proposed domination of the author. So Tolkien's Rohirrim, to use the example that he was using, are not allegorical for the Franks or the Vandals or any of the other points that he made. But it's not just because they're generic and can't be applied to any of these groups, particularly like the guy says, but it's because they are not intended to be allegorically representative of those groups. Through applicability, the reader is free to explore the Rohirrim however they want, through the lens of Germanic tribes or Vikings or cowboys if they really want to. And that's because the Rohirrim are not a one-to-one -one allegory with anything. And that brings us back to orcs. 
are they intended to be representative of people of color? In an allegorical sense, no. But applicability allows you to explore them as a representation of people of color if you'd like, or as a representation of the growing force of industrialization, as this gentleman suggests. It is within the freedom of the reader to explore these topics, not something that is directly allegorically stated by Tolkien. I want to reiterate that I don't think this guy is wrong outright. I just think that this topic deserves a little bit more nuance, and I'm not sure he really gave it the full exploration that it needed. Of course, then we go from talking about race relations to talking about gender. That's not a hot button issue at all. Very few women that I teach have read Lord of the Rings. Uh-oh. Wait. But I'm a woman. Does that mean... Does that mean no? No! I do agree with what they're saying to an extent, especially because when this movie came out, I was two years old, so I can't exactly fact check them on a personal level. The Lord of the Rings was pushed primarily towards boys, as is, or at least was, hopefully, most nerd things. But I do think that this is starting to change a little bit, and that makes me very happy, because I think that the Lord of the Rings and every story should be for everyone. They then show this picture for, like, the third or fourth time in the documentary. It has popped up on numerous occasions, which is very funny to me, because maybe I just lack reader comprehension or something, but um, I don't actually remember the scene in The Lord of the Rings where Gandalf and Frodo teamed up with a dark-haired woman with a flaming sword. And this is the picture that they choose to use when they're talking about how, no, actually women are represented in The Lord of the Rings. A picture of a woman who who is not, in fact, represented in The Lord of the Rings. And then they discuss how Eowyn breaks gender boundaries, which is true, but also kind of funny, because in the plot summary, they attribute the death of the Witch King of Angmar not to Eowyn, uh, like it is in the books, but to Mary. Mary creeps up behind and stabs him with the blade he'd taken from the Barrow Downs, and it kills the Nazgul. So even though, according to their plot summary, uh, Eowyn did not kill the Witch King of Angmar, she's still a girl boss. Yeah, this section is messy. But finally, we move past touchy discourse into visual art. This artist, Roger Dean, talks about how influential and inspirational Tolkien's works were to his artistic style. This is great until he says, It's a fabulous story and fabulous places, but not a lot of description. I mean, and I'm sorry, but did we read the same book? Because let's take a second to read one of these oh so under described passages. So this is Gimli describing the glittering caves to Legolas. Gems and crystals and veins of precious ore glint in the polished walls, and the light glows through folded marbles, shell like, translucent as the living hands of Queen Galadriel. There are columns of white and saffron and dawn rose Legolas, fluted and twisted into dreamlike forms. They spring up from many-colored floors to meet the glistening pendants of the roof. Wings, ropes, curtains as fine as frozen clouds. Spears, banners, pinnacles of suspended palaces. Yeah. If only Tolkien would have given us a little more detail. From here, we have a nice talk about the music inspired by The Lord of the Rings, including a long musical interlude from the band Mostly Autumn. And I gotta be honest, these are some rockin' tunes. Great vibes. Plus, they released music as recently as 2021, I believe, which means they're still going pretty strong, so rock on, guys. Towards the end, they start discussing the impact of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and honestly, I think this part is pretty sweet. They make a point that looking up Tolkien on the internet will get you as many as 120,000 hits, and, you know, looking at it today, well, that number's only gone up. They say that they hope the Lord of the Rings will continue to be a timeless work of art to be enjoyed by all, and well, I'm still talking about it 20 years later, so clearly something's going right. I think overall, this documentary suffers from a lack of focus. They just meander around vaguely related topics without fully discussing and diving into the topic of the documentary, at least according to its title, J.R.R. Tolkien. It feels like all these experts that they had on didn't really realize what the focus of the documentary was supposed to be, and never really came to a consensus on what they were trying to say. Tolkien was an incredibly interesting man whose life and philosophies I think are well worth studying, even if you don't talk that much about The Lord of the Rings. Understanding him lends so much depth to the things that he wrote. And I just wish that this documentary had been a little bit more committed to exploring him as a person in a full and well-rounded way. Overall though, this was definitely 
better put together than the last Lord of the Rings documentary that I watched, and I am hardly one to complain when people are going to talk about my favorite books. But overall, this really made me think about a lot of aspects that I haven't fully explored before, so I am very curious to hear what you guys have to say about the points that I made. A lot of these things are also topics that I will probably cover fully in their own videos at some point, so I would love to get your feedback now so I can kind of include that in future videos. Just from the future, popping in to mention that next week I'm going to be doing a little channel update and a Q&A. So if you have any questions either about me or about the Lord of the Rings, feel free to submit them to the Google form that I'll have in the description box or my Instagram or the comments section of this video, and I will gather those and answer some of them next week, as well as give some exciting channel updates. And I just want to say again, thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video, and make sure you use my code HOBBIT to get 55% off your order. It would be great if you could hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, and consider subscribing because we have a lot of fun over here and I would love it if you joined this community. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for watching this week, and I hope that you have a very happy, hoppity day.